All right, we're in chapter 13. We're doing a verse by verse study through the book of Revelation. And, you know, this is an interesting chapter. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, we, we ask that you would speak to us. We pray that again. And just give clarity to your word. Lord, help us to hear from you, to help us to respond in a way that's pleasing in your eyes. And Lord, just continue to reveal what's happening here on our world, in this earth, at this time, and what's to happen in the future. Thank you, Lord, for, for your continued grace and mercy in our life. And we turn this time over to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So somewhere in the mid-70s, uh, 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 real, basically a miracle in my life, I, I ended up moving from this area that I had lived in most of my life and found myself living in Lakeland, Florida, going to Bible college, which if you know anything about my history, my past, my family and upbringing, that would have been the last thing possible that ever occurred in my life. So here I was in Lakeland, Florida, and I had grown up uh, surfing with my older brother. Him and I were totally involved in surfing from the time I was 13 till I, till I moved to Lakeland, and that was when I was probably around 2021. And we had surfed on uh, Greg Knoll's surf team. We had surfed for Hobie and Blue Cheer, and my, my older brother, who was just about three years older than me, he turned pro. And he began to ride for different companies. And I went off to Lakeland to be a, well, I thought a pastor one day, or really my heart was uh, missions. I, I had a missions major, and I studied about missionaries and indigenous, you know, uh, people and in, in how they fit in their culture and how we could come alongside. And uh, I still, however, love surfing. And Cocoa Beach was only two hours from Lakeland, and I had a van, and if you remember the 70s, I had a bed in the back, shag carpet on the walls, paneling, you know, it was totally cool. So I would go to Cocoa Beach on the weekends, and I met some guys uh, at, the, at the campus who said they were surfers, and they, they had boards that looked pretty, pretty good. They had surf trunks that looked normal. They, they had the lingo. And so one weekend we piled in my van and we headed for the East Coast and, and went to a certain spot that I knew about because I had surfed Cocoa Beach many, many times. And the surf was amazing. It was like three to four feet, no wind, very glassy. And so we all, you know, got out in the water. And, and one of the best surfers in that area was surfing that, that break that morning, a guy named Claudie Coggins. And I knew Claudia, I had met him several times, and he was an amazing surfer, shaper. And so I'm paddling out, you know, I say hi to Claudia, and, and I've got these friends with me. But I realized that really none of these guys actually knew how to surf. <laughs> they said they did, they looked the part, but they're hanging off the back of their boards, they really don't know how to paddle, and they're, they're trying to follow me around. John, John, and I'm thinking, gosh, just go away, you know. <laughs> Don't let Claudie see you with me. And they were total kooks. I would say that they were posers. And I never wanted anyone to know they were with me. And as we step into Revelation chapter 13, we have one of the world's greatest posers. He's called the Antichrist. In our chapter today, the, the drama of chapter 12 continues. The, the dragon, if you remember. The, the, the whole scenario that we looked at last week with Wonder Woman and Star Wars, and there's this amazing thing that begins to occur, and the scene shifts. It, 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 it goes from this, this war in heaven to this view from heaven to now to the earth. In fact, look at chapter 12 with me for just a moment. I want you to remember how it ends and, and what's about to happen. It says there in verse 
12, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows his time is short. That's verse 12. So this is the shift from heaven to earth. And now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to earth, verse 13 of chapter 12, he persecuted the woman whom we saw was Israel who gave, earth, who gave birth to the male child. And then verse 17, the final verse, and the dragon was enraged there in chapter 12 with the woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the devil is, is on earth, he's mad, and he is about to reap havoc. This chapter introduces two men who will have global impact in the final days. The Antichrist, he's called, and the false prophet. John calls them beasts. That's his term for them. And when you think of the Antichrist, he's, he's part of a, an unholy trinity. You know, we have, as believers, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But this is an unholy trinity of the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Antichrist, in many times throughout Scripture, is known as the man of sin, the son of perdition, the mystery of iniquity, and sometimes labeled just simply the lie. The total opposite of, of the Lord who is Jesus Christ, who's the mystery of godliness, and who's the way, the truth, and the life. The, the, the Antichrist, as we'll see here, is kind of like uh, Satan's Messiah. Let's jump into chapter 13 and, and let's begin to read a few verses here. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowds, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon, which we know as Satan, gave him power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. He opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the Lamb's book of life. Then if anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And then I saw another beast, verse 11, coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. But he spoke like a dragon. The world's last dictator, if you will, the world's last world president. The world, I believe, is ripe like never before to embrace a satanic superman. It, it, it's, it's the stage is being set like never before. I mean, you know and I know that people are freaked out. They're freaked out by storms. They're freaked out by the fear of climate change, by the unstable economy, not just in America, but across the world. They're, they're fearful of this pandemic viral illness. 
Everyone's hearing as Putin has stepped up his game, the, 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 the threat of a nuclear incident or war. This is, this is in the back, in the forefront of many people's minds. There's, there's all this confusion and struggling with things like technology. Anybody struggle with technology? <laughs> I called a friend of mine who was a professor at the, at the school that I graduated from down at Southeastern. He, he went back and became a professor there, just recently retired, and I called him, and, and he, he, he has one of those watches that, you know, an Apple watch, I guess, and his, he can answer his phone on his watch, but he wanted to switch it to his phone, and he didn't know how to do it. So his son and his daughter-in-law were over because they had lost power down there in Lakeland. And he goes, just a minute, John, just a minute, John. He goes, I don't know how to switch from this to this. He goes, can, can you hold on just a second? I go, yeah, sure, you lame brain. I'll hang on for just a second. <laughs> I said, that's why I don't have an Apple Watch. <laughs> but people, people are struggling with technology. Here's a big one they're struggling with. They're struggling with gender. You know, I have a, have a, a daughter and a son-in-law who are, are, well, he's in the Navy, and uh, he's, he's planning on getting out of the Navy, and I said, he's, a, he's got an awesome job. He's an F-18 pilot. He loves what he does. I said, why are you getting out? He goes, well, the military's changed. And he began to describe the different things that they, they have to sit and, and obey now. It has to do with discrimination. It has to do with gender. It has to do with shots. It has to do with political issues. He says, we're like first in line as guinea pigs for all of this stuff. And the military, the whole military is changing radically with the woke situation that's going on in our country. So, so people are struggling with not only, you know, climate and economy and, and pandemic illness and nuclear war and technology and gender. They're, they're struggling with abortion, which has become a huge new issue again in, in our country. Uh, the explosion of deadly drugs, fentanyl, that's sweeping across our, 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 our land in, in record numbers, uh, sex trafficking. Uh, shooters. Uh, I mean, really, the list could go on and on and on of what's going on, not just in America, but worldwide. And a leader will arise with a sense of with a sense of mission, a sense of destiny. Uh, an individual will rise with a sense of purpose and answers and power. And, and we read here in, in chapter 13, I, I saw, I stood on the sand of the sea and, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowds, and on his head a blasphemous name. When we read he comes out of the sea... You, you want to interpret Scripture with Scripture. So if you just go forward a little bit to chapter 17, we have an interpretation of what this means in verse 15, where it says, Then he said to me, in chapter 17 of Revelation, verse 15, The waters which you saw where the, where the harlot sits are peoples, their multitudes, their nations, their, their tongues. So he rises out of a sea of people. A great mass of people. He, he, he's, it's a sea of, of humanity, and he's called a beast. And he, he's wild, he's ferocious. He's under the control of Satan. In fact, they're, they're very similar in description. In chapter 12, it tells us that the dragon, in verse 13, that, that he had been cast to the earth and per persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. And he's described in verse 3, he said, a great fiery red dragon, seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. The beast has a similar look. Maybe it's a uh, family likeness, I don't know. But they differ in number and position of crowns. The dragon has seven on his head, and the Antichrist has ten on his horns. And many scholars believe that the seven heads represent seven mountains. And once again, we go over to Revelation chapter 17, where we get an explanation of what this is. It says, here is the mind which has wisdom, verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So, so these seven mountains... Many believe that 
Rome was built on seven hills and that the ten horns represent ten kingdoms. There in chapter 17, we, we, we saw that in, in verse 12. If you, if, you, if, if you look at that again in chapter 17, it says, The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So many believe that it's a, it's a, it's a kingdom of, of, of ten nations, a united group, sort of foreshadowed in some ways by the European Union, that the, the world is headed toward this, this leader. It's headed towards a one world leader with 10 different kingdoms combined, a one world government. And, and verse two of our, of our chapter has a, a interesting description as we, as we see there in chapter 13. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth, chapter 13, verse 2, like the mouth of a lion, the dragon gave him power, his throne, and great authority. It's a very similar view, if you know the book of Daniel, chapter 7, where it talks about the leopard and the bear and the lion, the leopard being the, the Grecian Empire, the bear being the Medes and the Persians, and the lion being Babylon, that great world power. And the Antichrist will be like a leopard. He'll conquer quickly, rapidly. A feet like the, the, the Persian, strong and organized and stable. And boasting of great things like Babylon, the lion. He, he will communicate very arrogantly. He will control very excessively. And he'll conquer, this is what's being said, very swiftly. Ver verse 3 here in chapter 13. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled, not only marveled, but then they followed. And it appears there's some kind of accident, or, or maybe it's an apparent assassination attempt. And there's a remarkable, miraculous healing or recovery, and people are astounded. And the response is the world is following this con artist. It's like the ultimate man. He's a, he's a hero, he, he's a genius, he's adored, a, a leader without question. It seems like he's invincible. They try to kill him, he comes back, they worship him. And the enemies behind this Antichrist, they worshiped him, it says in verse 4. The dragon gave him authority, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who's able to make war with him? And this is always something Satan has always wanted. He's always wanted worship. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, you have this, this verse that talks about uh, Jesus, the devil, took him on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And, and that's what the enemy wants. All the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. He's always wanted worship. And he's the Antichrist can only operate, however, within the parameters given to him by God. He's given a delegated time and certain abilities. It tells us in verse 5, and he was given a mouth. Ever known anyone who's been given a mouth? <laughs> well, the Antichrist has a mouth, and it's a big mouth. And, and, and he's given the power to make war, it says, in this passage. He's given a mouth, he, he speaks blasphemies, he's given authority to continue for 42 months. It's blasphemy, verse six, against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle. And it was granted to him not only to have this mouth that, that, that blasphemes God, that's very arrogant and proud, but also to make war over a sort of an authority over the peoples of the world, only, only given by God. 
And I remember at this time that, that the church has been raptured, but this is the tribulation period where Satan has kind of given his last chance. And he's ravaging the world. It's a mouthful of blasphemy and lies and, 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 and says great things about himself. He, he's very proud. He, he's the epitome of arrogance and pride. The Apostle Paul kind of puts it like this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It says, he opposes, speaking of the enemy, exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, how arrogant can that be? How, how, how deceptive can that be? He not only slanders God, but also wants to destroy those who follow the Lord. And many in this time period of the tribulation will be martyred for their faith. It's a, it's a three and a half years, the second half of tribulation, and the Antichrist has this insatiable thirst for power. He's been cast out of heaven, as we saw last week, and he's making war on earth, and he's pushing for this one world government. Verse 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and authority was given to him. Here it is, the one world government. Over, look, look what it says there. It was, it was given to him for every, every, every tribe it talks about. Every tongue and every nation. John kind of sums it up, if you will, and in, in verse 8, it says, all who dwell on the earth. At this time, he, he establishes his authority. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Those whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You know, people have described it like this. Bible scholars have, have looked at it like this. There's, there's two books. There's the book of life that everybody's name is written down when they're born. That, and then there's the Lamb's Book of Life that everybody's name is written down in who are born again, who come to Christ. And this is saying that the followers of Jesus Christ, those who follow, uh, their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not. There. So there's, there's basically two kinds of people on the face of the earth at that time. Those whose names have written in the Lamb's book of life and those who have not. There's the saved and the unsaved. There's the followers of Jesus Christ and there's those who aren't. There's those who've been born once and there's those who have been born twice. And every person on the face of the earth has a choice, a decision to make. The Apostle John says in his gospel that these things are written, well, in, in 1 John, these things are written that you might know that you have everlasting life. And so the Bible reveals how a person can know for sure they have everlasting life. And John chapter 3 Verse 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him, and especially during this time of the great tribulation. There is, for you and I, who know the Lord, there's an outward expression of it through our lifestyle and the way we live, and there's an inward reality of it, of receiving Jesus Christ in our heart and his spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are sons and daughters of God. In Romans chapter 10, it, it kind of says it like this. For with the heart, one believes. There is this initial time where, you, where, where your heart is, is touched, where Jesus stands on the outside and knocks on the door of your heart and, and says, if you'll let me, I will come in. And he comes in if you open the door. But then there's confession with the mouth, the, the inward, and then there's the outward. And some people say, oh, yeah, I know the Lord, but there's never any outward expression of it in their life. 
And then someone are, some people are posers. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I got a Bible, I go to church. But there's nothing ever really changed in their heart. There, there, there has to be both the inward reality of the heart and the outward response of the mouth. And, and verse 8 here in chapter 13, look at it. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose name hath not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So there's a choice. And even during that time, people will be making choices to follow the Lord or to follow the beast. It tells us, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. And this is written for us now that we would recognize that there will be those who will go through this time, who will be experiencing this. And this is why we have the opportunity at this time to share with people about the fact that they can receive in their heart and they can live out in their life a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, that's our call. That's our mission. That's why we're here. And so he is, he's sharing that with us. And then he says, if you can hear this, hear it. He who leads into captivity, verse 10, shall go, and he who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This is God's mercy. If you have an ear to hear, hear. You don't have to go through this. You don't have to be a part of this. And then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. It's an interesting scenario. And he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. It's almost like he's involved in this healing because it says he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by these signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich, poor, free, slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or number on his, of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who understand and calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. This number is six. Six, six. So this is a description of this third member of the unholy trinity, the beast coming out of the earth, the, the, the world's new religious leader, also spoken of as the false prophet. The, the two horns represent power and authority, but there's no crown. His authority is not political not the crowns of the ten nations. It's, it's, it's more, I believe, his authority is more of his testimony and his false teaching. His territory is not political. He looks like a lamb, it says, but when he speaks, it says, he speaks like a dragon, sort of a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, if you will. He's a spokesman for Satan, it says. He elevates the Antichrist. It's a religious deception that involves the whole world without Jesus Christ, without the one true God. He's a miracle worker, it says in verse 13. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. All kinds of unexplained, miraculous things. And people like follow, follow this guy. Like, wow, he calls fire down. Who could call fire down from heaven? He, he, he seems he's involved in the healing of the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power signs, lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe in the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So this guy is, is able to do miraculous things. Pe people who do not want to believe in Jesus Christ, who, who think that, that that's narrow, that's arrogant, that's, that's you know, in some way, uh, those Christians, they'll fall in line with this guy. In chapter 13, verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs, which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling who's, those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted power. This is a radical thing, to, to, to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. It's a statue, some kind of aberration. I don't know what. It looks like the Antichrist, possibly set in the temple, the third temple in Jerusalem, which will be rebuilt. You've got this mixture of religion and politics, and people are forced into worship. This is the agenda of the Antichrist and the false prophet. It's a one-world religion. Do you know that, that right now, that, that in Berlin, they, they've already laid the, the first bricks, but they're building a thing called a Chermoskagog. Have you heard of this? It's a, it's a combination of the church, a mosque, and a synagogue. This is not a fairy tale. It's actually happening. And Pope Francis is totally behind it. And he says that uh, we all worship the same God. I'm thinking... I don't think I worship the same God as, as Islam. You say, well, John, they, they worship the God of Abraham. Yeah, but they don't worship the God of Isaac. They certainly don't worship the God of Jacob. And, and so there's this, there's this thing going on already in our world. And in Berlin, they, they, the, 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 the Jew and the Muslim and the Christian, at least from the Catholic persuasion, are in the process of wanting to build this thing called the Chermaskagog, where they can all come together and worship together this one true God, a common worldwide faith, or at least a faith policy that people want to fall into, a common foreign policy, the one world government. Now, I, I don't know if you pay a lot of attention to the news. I don't watch a lot of news anymore. It's too depressing, and I don't know what to believe. But, but I think we do know that there's a lot going on in this, this push for, for global unity, for, for global harmony, for let's save the planet. And, and, and one of the things I think you're going to see more and more of is this push for a common worldwide faith, uh, a worldwide uh, uh, government, uh, and, uh, and also, I believe, a common financial policy, which he speaks of here. Here's the wisdom, you know, talking about he, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, receive a mark on their, 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 their right hand or their foreheads, and no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. It's a global requirement. And here's the deal. You get a mark, and things flow well for you. You can buy, you can sell, you can travel. It, it, it's no mark, big problem. No mark, you're economically sidelined. It's kind of like no seal, no deal. You know what I'm saying? No seal, no sale. It, it's a sign of allegiance. It's a sign of solidarity and loyalty and identification from the richest to the poorest. No exceptions. It's your passport to life, to future, and you do have a choice. You do your right hand or your forehead. That's your choice. That's your only choice. And, and, and I think we know that financial institutions and world economy leaders are already in line for a cashless society, right? I mean, think of all the issues that that solves. I mean, 
there's all kind of reasons and, and purposes behind it. Every check that you write or I write costs the bank about 35 to 60 cents to process. The banks would love to get away from cash, from checks, and go to this kind of process. It does away with, with fraud, uh, identity theft. No one else is going to have your chip or your mark or, or, or you know, uh, small businesses would, would like us because thousands and thousands of millions of dollars are lost every year from employees taking money out of cash registers and putting it in their pockets. Do away with that. Not, not to mention the whole situation where the government loses millions of unclaimed uh, uh, payments to people for taxes because of cash paid under the table. Anybody ask you, say, just, just pay me in cash. Just pay me in cash, if you will. The whole drug world is all cash. Uh, you won't have to worry about getting robbed at the ATM machine anymore. It, this whole push toward the cashless society and all the technology is in place. And I will submit to you that it's in place because if, if you're my age or, or close to that, you're like, well, I, I like going to the bank or I like writing a check. You know what? The generation under you does not. They'll step right into it. They love it. And that's where we're at as a world. That's where we're at as a, uh, there, there's this, there's this, place where we're living right now and, and the society and the culture and the world that we live in, that a new generation is, is stepping into place and whether you're for it or against it, it's kind of like the vaccine. It could happen overnight. I mean, how, how shocking was that? I, I was in California not long after the whole, whole uh, pandemic and my wife and I were there. Uh, I actually uh, had to do a funeral for a close friend of mine and we, we stayed over for a few days and we're hanging out and just kind of like bummed out because we lost this great friend. And, and I said, Let, let's, let's go see a movie. We haven't seen a movie in a million years. So I'm looking through the, the movie stuff and everyone I saw said, you must have a vaccine card to come into the theater. I didn't have a vaccine card. I put the mark on my head and I tried that. That didn't work. No. <laughs> But it, it can happen so fast. So, you, know, you can't get on an airplane. You can't buy. You can't sell. Th this is like something that I think that's not, you know, crazy. Uh, it, you know, and, and, you know, my dog has a chip. John, John kind of closes out with this. He says that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. His number is 666. If anyone has insight or understanding. Now, now we all heard about 666. And everybody's paranoid over that number. You know, if, if you... If your address at home is 666, all your neighbors are looking at you like, all kinds of bizarre ideas and things. And people, you know, use numerology to try to figure out, you know, who's the Antichrist, the 66. And they, they said it was Nero, it was Hitler. You know, they work out numbers somehow. It was, it was Kissinger at one time. It was Gorbachev. It's Trump, whoever, you know, the 666. Somehow they work it out where their names are somehow, you know, uh, equal 666. Well, you, you can make numbers say anything. I mean, Goliath, the giant, he was six cubits in height. His spearhead weighed six shekels. And he had six pieces of armor. <laughs> Goliath was the Antichrist. And he tried to wipe out Israel. Give me a man. Whoa. Nebuchadnezzar. His image was 60 cubits tall, six cubits wide, and man was created on the sixth day. It must be Nebuchadnezzar. 
So, so six, it tells us here in verse 18, it says something interesting here. It says, for it is the number of man. You know, my dog, he's got a chip. His name is Roscoe. That's six letters. <laughs> and I've seen him worship the Antichrist. <laughs> and I'm not talking about my wife. <laughs> I'm not. But, but what is this 666? And what does it mean, you know, the, the number of man? It's always, you know, people take this thing to all kinds of extremes. Well, he represents the ultimate unregenerate, unregenerate man, full of power, politically, religiously, economically. It, it's it's the, the number of man is six because he's created on the sixth day. And, and for some reason, that's his number. And I, I think it really just has to do with the ultimate man. I don't think you have to go into numerology and try to figure all this out. He's, it's, 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 it's three times six. It's, this guy is the ultimate, final Superman here on the face of the earth with his false prophet. And the pace and events of the world are picking up with speed and intensity and complexity. And, and we're racing toward, I think, a great and inevitable return of Jesus Christ. Now, you and I are waiting for that, that wonderful being caught up before this time. But this, I think, is something that, that encourages us to be bold about our faith, to, to, to recognize what's coming upon the face of the earth, and to see the signs of the time. I mean, I, I think we live in a time that's unprecedented it's economically, politically. Uh, we, 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 we see what's going on financially in the world. And, and everything changes so rapidly. Technologically. I mean, I, I don't even understand. You know, I, I don't, I'm not a big social media guy, I'll admit. But what I don't understand is, how technology has created this whole new venue of people who economically are succeeding in amazing ways by posting their stuff on, online, and, and they all want to be your coach. Amen. I'm going to train you how to be me, and you're going to pay me to do it, and I'll coach you for the rest of your life, or at least until you keep paying me. And there's a ma and maybe you're one. I'm not opposed to that. It's just that it's amazing how technology has created so many different venues and how it'll how how things change so rapidly. I, I don't know what's going on in the whole economic world. I do know this. It doesn't seem like anybody's got a job anymore. <laughs> I, I was somewhere just recently, and 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 uh, oh, it was it was it was Walmart. I was buying a mum. My wife said, oh, I want a mum for the front porch. Okay, I'll go get a mum. So I get a, she's a big fall freak. And so I buy this mum, and this, this lady's working, and, and I, she's over there putting up Christmas decorations. <laughs> Christmas is 11 weeks away, by the way. So, so she's putting up Christmas decorations. And I said, is this register open? She goes, oh, yeah, yeah. So she comes over, and she's, she's not in a good mood. And she's ringing. I said, so you doing all right? He goes, no, I've been here since 7 this morning. I get off at 6. I go, wow, that's a long day. Why? Why are you here so long? She goes, no one, no one showed up for work today. And, you know, we're shorthanded. And I go, where is everybody? And she goes, I don't know. Do you, you ever ask that question? The whole, the whole world seems to be shifting and changing. And, and we have this picture in chapter 13 of the end times that, that has to deal with these two individuals that are called beasts. And, 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 and one is this sort of dictator, the other is this false prophet, and they usher in this amazing time when people go through horrendous issues because they're either for him or against him. They're either saved or they're unsaved. There's this choice you can make, not only to have a, 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 a sign on your forehead or your right hand, but also, do you have Jesus Christ in your heart, and do you confess him with your mouth? And that's a choice that we also have. And it's an amazing choice.
And I would pray that if you're here today, that you've made that choice to follow Jesus Christ. And that you never have to go through this time that has to do with a antichrist and a false prophet. And one of the ways, one of the ways that you confess that is by how we're going to do it in just a moment, is by publicly sharing communion together. It's, it's a way that people confess the fact that I've, I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, and I am part of his body, the church. And it's, it's a significant thing that, that Jesus instituted at the end of his life. He said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. I want you to remember the fact that I gave my blood for you, that I gave my life for you, and that you now can be washed, you can be clean, and you can be a part of the body of Christ that was birthed on the day of Pentecost, where 3,000 came into the, to the church, and God was glorified on that day, and it's been going ever since, and it'll go until the end of time.